on this whole thing, which is, you know, again, like speculating, it's, 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 you're going to drink a bunch of alcohol and you're going to pop a bunch of Tylenol PMs and, and just let it, let it go, you know? Well, even if she right. wasn't taking the Tylenol PM then, say that she just took it to sleep, you know. Yeah, we don't know if she took any or right. nothing like that. We just but, know that she did pack that with, with the stuff that she brought. But I've taken Tylenol PM, and I have some in my cabinet now, but I, I only use it when I'm having trouble sleeping. So, right. th- But that also tells me something about the person who's taking it. If I have trouble sleeping, then that means I'm stressed out or something a little different is going on in my life. You know, I, I may have insomnia. Insomnia isn't a normal condition that people who are, you know, happy people, non-stressed people have. Mm-hmm. Very rarely, I'll say, would, would, would have that. But she was she was a very good athlete. Uh, and at one time, uh, I think she, uh, I know family spokespeople have tried to definitely uh, speak out about this. And they've said that she had a reoccurring knee injury and she was taking those the Tylenol PM to kind of help that out, maybe maybe to sleep, for instance, at nighttime. So, you know, but she hadn't run competitively in, in uh, at least a year or more at the time of her accident. So, I, you know, I don't know. I could see it. No, it could be completely innocent. I just wanted right. to point out. I just wanted. I want to make sure that's out there, though, because that's important. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and then you have the bus driver uh, who came across Mara. Uh, the first thing that, or one of the first things that he did, as I understand, is he had to kind of get on her a little bit because she was sitting in the, sitting in the road with her car partially sticking in. She didn't have any lights on at all. Didn't have flashers on, nothing. And this is a dark car we're talking about. Uh, at nighttime, as anybody could have came and came uh, around that corner and hit her, hit her again. And so she was sitting in her car. Uh, I don't I have no idea what she was up to. But she didn't have any lights on. She was, doesn't sound like she was trying to bring attention to herself. And he, he just kind of stumbled upon her and, and, uh, and confronted her. So how far behind Mora do you think Butch was in his bus when she crashed? So she crashes and he shows up. Was he um, far enough, say, where he didn't see the taillights? I can only guess. I'm going to say it's around 730, 735 in that range. Is when he arrived. Uh, we do know for a fact that he attempted to call 911 himself around 7:40. We know for a fact that the first 911 call came at 7:27. So between 7:27 and 7:40, he had his full interaction with her and made it to his house and called 911. So his first attempt to call 911 did not work. So he actually had to have the Hanover dispatch. Uh, get in touch with the Grafton County dispatch to get his 911 call through the second time, and that came through at 7:43 p.m. Was he calling from a cell phone or his home phone? I think it was his. I think he yelled from his bus for his either wife or girlfriend. That's never been established to me if it was his wife or his girlfriend to uh, call. So I think she called the first time, and then I think he kind of, kind of piggyback got on, got on the, got on and helped his his wife or girl or uh, girlfriend call and give the information out so what do you say to the people who believe that butch may have been involved just and, yeah yeah and timeline just doesn't doesn't add up for that i mean the, you know the guy he's an older guy and it, it, just not enough time i mean my god he the only thing he could have done was to convince her to come with him to his house hide her out until everybody left from that from that uh accident location that night and then do something afterwards and he lived in a house with his wife slash girlfriend and his mother and both of them his mother worked for the police department at one time i think she was a nurse at at the time this happened uh his his wife was a bus driver he was a bus driver you know i this is somebody there's no way no possible way he was involved in anything sinister but i wanted to really touch on this because uh this is not said a lot uh the fact that uh, that night, there was kind of an investigation that took place, uh, and it involved a lot of people. And I don't think that gets gets put out there a lot because of the way the news reports came out about that at night. Uh, there was a volunteer fire in, or monthly meeting going on around that the accident location. And so they all heard the call go out on the, the radio. And so we're talking, uh, I think it was 12 people went just from, just from that to the accident location so you had this whole volunteer fireman force 
you had uh, emergency personnel respond. I think there was two guys uh, from like EMS that re responded. You had the lead investigator. He enlisted the help of the bus driver and the uh, Westmans. I think they went to the uh, antique store, the Weathered Barn, and I think they opened that up to see if maybe somehow she had gotten into there. And so you had a ton of people out looking that night for, for Mara. Just didn't find her. Do you happen to know if the police searched the houses in the area? The main guy, the, the first responder that showed up, he was on scene uh, well past everybody else. He, he cleared the scene at 9.26 p.m. So that's he was on scene after arriving at 7.29. So that's almost two full hours. So I would imagine that that included going house to house in, the, in that area and, and trying to talk to people. So he was on scene at least a half hour after the car was already towed. So I don't know what else he'd be doing during that time. Yeah, talking to neighbors or possibly going to houses. That's very interesting. And then we have the rag in the tailpipe, and, and uh, it's it's been it's been reported that the actual the, the same officer that first responded is the guy that found the rag in the tailpipe. So then that gets into the whole you know situation. What what? What, what Fred said, and does that add up what Fred said about you know, warning his daughter that if her car is smoking to stick a rag in the tailpipe to kind of cover that up and and all that stuff. And, and you know, I, I have never really been able to, to believe that account. I, I, you know, just does, something about that just doesn't add up. And so when I try to put everything into context, and I'm going back to actual 911 logs uh, the next day, when Fred is, is, is trying desperately to get a hold of this first responding officer because he has very important information he wants to tell him concerning his daughter. Uh, that information ends up being that, it, that uh, he thinks his daughter went to the White Mountains to do personal harm to herself. And that's, that's what the lead investigator of the case said was the first words out of Fred's mouth. So, so knowing that and knowing that the investigators are starting to, are trying to put a picture of who Mara was, uh, they think that she came to their area to do harm to herself. So when Fred actually gets to the area, they're going to start confronting him on, on this kind of stuff. And that's personally what I think happened is I think they mentioned this rag in the tailpipe and, and Fred had to come up with a quick answer for that because it didn't take Fred long to realize that, that the suicide angle is, 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 is bad because police aren't going to pursue that like they would a missing an actual a uh, person of a crime, a crime that occurred that night. You know, if you have a person that goes walks away into the mountains, that, and they're an adult and they did it on their own free will, you're not going to get the kind of uh, investigation that you would get if it was somebody that met up with foul play. So Fred tells the police that he thinks that Mora went into the woods to kill herself. How how long between that and when he said she was probably abducted by? some local dirt bag. I don't personally have never talked to Fred, so I do not know uh I do not I can't go by his own word, which obviously would be very valuable to hear him talk about some of this stuff. But we can go by what he said in, in accounts and newspaper accounts and and in the days after Mara went missing, the, some of the things that he was directly quoted as saying is is that uh, I don't I don't know what the matter is or what trouble you think you might be in, but this isn't anything we can't solve. It's me. You can tell me. We'll work it out until we solve it. And that was a direct quote from him, directly speaking to his daughter after she had gone missing. Okay, but two weeks later, he's completely changed his terms, and he said in one article. We should think of this in terms of a criminal investigation. It sounds like it would be the key to expanding it. Let's grab the bull by the horns and call this foul play. And ever since then, he's pretty much stuck with a, a theory of a local dirt bag grabbing, grabbing Mara. And so what happened in that time to change his point of view? Yeah, and then we can always speculate. Right. But, I, but, but the, his statements are, are there. I mean, it's, you know, it's what he said. It's... Yeah, his his pleas early on were directly tomorrow. They weren't to a kidnapper. They yeah. were directly tomorrow. It's very and then, interesting and, and contradictory almost. Right, exactly. It's contradictory because he's always criticized the local law enforcement. Correct. Right, and that, I mean, yeah. After, and you know, I'll be honest. I'll you probably already know my theory because I haven't been. I've been trying to kind of stay away from it, but I think that Mara 